My name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Dean of Engineering, and it's my uh, honor and privilege to welcome our inspirational leader, President Meng Chiang, to the stage here. Thank you, Dean Raman. Uh, I thought you were a mechanical engineer, but uh, now I realize, you know, you indeed truly are. You are already calculating uh, how many people can be there on the bridge. On the bridge of uh, the amazing Armstrong Hall of Engineering. And 55 years ago, a border maker, Neil Armstrong, whose statue is out there, the most popular selfie spot on campus, took a small step and a giant leap. And today, as just announced an hour ago, uh, in the presence of Senator Young and Director Prabhakar, whom I'll be introducing properly in just a minute, uh, along with the governor and many other visitors uh, from a federal, state, local government, and ambassador that SK Hynex, the world's sixth largest semiconductor company, uh, is now investing $4 billion to start with in a memory AI chip advanced packaging site here in West Lafayette on Purdue Research Park. Now what this means is that as students, you get to have even more opportunities right here, learning while working, interning, and doing co-op with an amazing company, world's number one provider of AI memory chips. As professors, you have the opportunities to research, collaborate, and jointly create many IPs, not only in memory for AI, but also across a broad range of science, technology, and business fields. And as a bottlemaker said, Easter Sunday afternoon, that he used to be overlooked, but you can't overlook him anymore. Well, this university and our state can't be overlooked anymore when it comes to AI. Now, it's a distinct pleasure to welcome the leader in the White House for AI and for the implementation of the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act of 2022. Dr. Arati Prabhakar is a long-standing and outstanding leader in federal government, in private practice, and in research herself. And it is only most fitting to have someone who actually wrote a PhD dissertation in the science of semiconductors to lead our nation's effort to revitalize semiconductors and lead in the age of AI. And equally honored I am to welcome to stage in this fireside chat our own senior U.S. Senator from the great state of Indiana, Senator Todd Young, who co-sponsored the Chips and Science Act. In fact, Four years ago, right around this time, spring, Senator, you will remember you were starting to champion for the Endless Frontiers Act, using the same phrase that Vannevar Bush started in 1945-46. And we are, as a nation, at another critical juncture. For national security, economic security, and job security, thank you for your leadership, Senator Young and Director Prabhakar, welcome to Purdue. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Um, uh, Director Prabhakar, Senator Young, it's really an honor and a Privileged to have you both with us. Um, and you know, let me just start off by clarifying, in case it isn't uh, abundantly clear, that we are really good at other things besides basketball and economic development here <laughs> at Purdue. Um, you know, we are uh, the number one computer science uh, historically program, the first CS uh, granting uh, program started here at Purdue. Today, it's the largest top ranked engineering program uh, in the country. Uh, the sky, you know, as it comes to space, uh, this is where it all began, the cradle of astronauts. 27 astronauts and counting from Neil Armstrong, uh, in whose name this building is, to Laurel O'Hara, who's up in space right now. The largest number of astronauts uh, from any civil university uh, in the United States. 
This is home to Amelia Earhart, to Lillian Gilbreth, and uh, today one of the uh, leading uh, universities in hypersonics and um, energetics um, in um, life sciences, and now today the leading semiconductor university in the United States. So welcome to the Boilermaker community. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here, everyone. Would you like to say a few words? Well, uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with Director Prabhakar and, and uh, all of you. I, I am so privileged to uh, have my opportunity to be of service to uh, this institution in some small way, to partner with it on this Chips and Science Act initiative, to bring semiconductor manufacturing and packaging uh, back to the state of Indiana for maybe some of your uh, future employment opportunities um, and uh, to bolster our national security in the process. Four years ago, as your president, Meng Cheng, emphasized, I introduced the Endless Frontier Act. And, and the theory of the case was that uh, the United States of America over the years had come to underinvest, underinvest in research, which historically See, the space race is, has had an amazing payoff for our country. So we propose, Senator Schumer and myself, to double, triple down on our investments in uh, research, not just basic research, but also areas of applied research, learning from our own economic history. And it was fairly apparent early on in that process uh, that we could also use this opportunity at this moment in history to uh, fund the CHIPS initiative as well, to strengthen our supply chain, to ensure that the United States of America became less dependent on other countries and uh, their nodes of the supply chain for mission critical semiconductors, uh, which go into things like uh, our weapon systems, uh, our smartphones and, and uh, various other devices that are, are necessary for a modern economy. We got that done with a whole lot of work, but that was only half of, of uh, the challenge. The other half is to make sure that implementation went well. Uh, I have to say the Biden administration, it won't surprise anyone. I don't agree with them on everything, but on this, they have just done tremendously well. They've been all business and uh, they have looked at passing out subsidies for semiconductor manufacturer on a very objective basis. Indiana, and West Lafayette won. You won this opportunity on your merits. We're gonna make the most of this opportunity together. And then I see many more positive announcements to come for the state of Indiana to build on this success. I should note, because I don't think the president mentioned it, and he rarely does he miss an opportunity to, to brag about Purdue, as he should. There's a lot to brag about. Uh, but this is the largest economic development announcement in Indiana's history. And as I say, there is more to come. So very excited to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Director Prabhak. This is great. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I just want to say I am delighted to be at Purdue. I have worked with people from Purdue in um, a lot of my public sector life. I was at DARPA where I funded projects at Purdue. I've seen amazing things come out of this place. But to actually be here in West Lafayette and be with all of the students is a dream. I love it. I'm so excited to get into this with you all. When I go to college campuses, I love meeting with the engineering and science students, and I've gotten to do it in lots of different places. I've never gotten to do it with a United States senator, so this is awesome. And as you, you know, as you all know, Senator Young is someone who cares passionately about the things that all of us care about, which is how do you use science and technology to make the future a better place to move the country forward and make make the world a better place and the the progress that we've made I think is just so important it was great fun to be able to celebrate the announcement this morning and um, it to me what's happening here in Indiana with Purdue and the work that you all are doing is a, a one piece of this idea that the purpose that science and technology plays in our society in our world is to make it possible to create a better future, to do the things that change people's lives. That happens when we reinvigorate semiconductor manufacturing for our economy and for national security and lead the, the kinds of manufacturing investments that lead to jobs. It, it happens when we 
think about the technologies and drive the technologies that matter for national security more broadly, thinking about everything it's going to take to be able to make sure we maintain stability in this changing geopolitics. Uh, we, science and technology is critical for um, how we change American health outcomes, which are not acceptable for the richest country in the world. They're vital for how we're going to create opportunity for every single person in this country, the unfinished notion, the unfinished idea of what America is. Science and technology is critical for how we're going to solve the climate crisis. We've made great progress, and there's a ton more that we have got to, to get done. And as we develop these technologies, like these powerful technologies like AI, we've got to figure out how to get them right so that, so that we seize their benefits by managing their risks. That's the agenda for everything that we're working on in science and technology. And uh, it, for me, it is just a tremendous privilege to get to work for President Biden uh, and to work with leaders like Senator Young and to do the work of the country together in science and tech. I'll just finish my opening here by just, I just want to tell you that I feel I just hit Medicare age, I just hit 65. So for a lot of decades, I've gotten to work on these things that I am so passionate about. And it's been such a satisfying uh, life to get to, to do this work. Uh, that journey for me began where your journey is beginning. For me, it began in a public university, Texas Tech University in my case, studying engineering. And I learned a lot about equations, but I'll tell you the single most important thing I learned was the fact that we engineers have agency in the world and we get to work on the things that change the future. And um, I'm so excited when I look around the room and up on the balcony and uh, to think about what you all are gonna do, but uh, to know that you can do anything from starting at a place like Purdue. Thanks for having me, let's get into it. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, um, we have a bunch of questions uh, by the students and so here's what we're gonna do is I'm gonna call upon a few students first uh, who had expressed interest in questions. Uh, and then we'll open the floor to the other students to ask questions, right? So when you do stand up and ask your questions, my request is, you know, tell the director and the senator something about yourself uh, and then direct your question to either one or both of them, all right? So let's get started here. Uh, Catherine Brower, go for it. Hi, I am an undergrad in biological engineering here and I'm minoring in biotechnology. And I really wanted to hear from the both of you, what were some of the best experiences you had in undergrad that helped you get to this point in your career right now? Both of them? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, well, thank you so much for the question. And um, I have to say, I had an unconventional college experience. I attended the US Naval Academy and Raise your hand if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs uh, personality tests. All right, probably just about everyone. Um, I think this will resonate with a lot of folks, but uh, the, the profile, for, the typical profile for an entering freshman at the U.S. Naval Academy at the time, probably hasn't changed, was ESTJ, so extrovert, sensing, thinking, judging. I discovered that I was an INFP. So... This was a round peg, square hole sort of, of situation. It was very, very challenging for me. Moreover, I was a recruited athlete. I played soccer. And that probably had something, uh, you know, to my getting in uh, at that year to say nothing. It was probably a week re recruiting classes as well. I discovered once I got to the school, I know this will sound naive to all of you scholarly individuals. It's an engineering school. I'm an arts and letters sort of guy by, by nature. And so it was very challenging to me. So I, 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 I'm having a difficult time isolating any particular experience. But I just say that, that experience of mixing with people who see the world entirely differently than I do, uh, of being forced just through exposure and challenge to work on my weaknesses uh, really helped make me the person I am. It wasn't always fun, but it was an experience of going through that crucible, learning the skills of an extrovert, uh, learning uh, how to think linear, linearly and with some uh, measure of scientific discipline about problems. And that 
that experience informs a lot of the work I do today. Moreover, to build on something uh, Director Prabhakar said, it's really important. Um, I learned how you can take those engineering and math discipline, science, and solve the world's problems. That seems so obvious to all of you. It's not obvious to everyone else. It inspired me, um, and it led me in some way with great intentionality to working on this legislative effort called the Chips and Science Act. So I just want to encourage all of you to, you know, uh, whether it's semiconductors or another field, take, take the baton and, and run with it. You can change the world. And dare I say, with all the challenges, uh, you had a presentation on climate before this, as I understand it, we all have some measure of responsibility to use the skills and opportunities we have to change the world in a positive way. So um, that's it. That's it. Going through the crucible at Annapolis was my experience. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I, I really touched on the thing that I found formative when I was an undergraduate at Texas Tech. The department chair when I was there was uh, Professor Russell Seacat. I still remember him. And he would tell every entering class about what the role of an engineer was in, in society and in the world and, and, and in a company that, you know, he thought each of us was going to go off into. And he explained that everyone else had really important roles but that there was this special thing about making something happen that, that had not been possible before, that that's what engineers could do, and that's how we created value in the world. And you know, I, I went from Texas Tech to Caltech for graduate school, and even though they both end in tech, the cultures could not have been more different. Caltech is a, a place that, you know, its highest value is, is pure physics, right? And so it's like a very physics-oriented culture, very science-y culture. And un just understanding new physics for its own sake was what people ran to work for every morning. And I was like, that's interesting. I don't, I don't really quite get that because, like, don't you want to use that and change the world. And so that culture, I mean, I learned a lot of really important things at Caltech and everywhere else, but that culture of the point is to make the future better than the past actually stems all the way back to that, that engineering uh, notion. That's great. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Anushka, would you like to ask a question? Space is most definitely, oh, I, I apologize. I neglected to introduce myself. I'll fix that now. I'm Anushka Sharma. I'm a junior studying aerospace engineering. I'm also a member of the John Martinson Honors College. So space is most definitely on my mind in orbit and also a grand challenge of the 21st century. As we begin to develop new technology, can you share a little on how you hope we will evolve in space and its applications, specifically focusing on the convergence between space as a measure of defense that is protecting critical US assets. We have commercial interests and also scientific exploration for the pursuit of pure knowledge. In addition, could you share a little bit more about space policy, what that overarching space policy looks like, and how it's going to reinvent the way that Americans think about space? Dr. Prabhakar and Senator Young, both your thoughts would be most appreciated. Thank you. I'll start. First of all, I think you answered your own question because that's what's going down right now on orbit. The Soviet Union got to orbit first with um, Sputnik and it, it shook us. We got going. And then for decades, uh, we got to do whatever we wanted on orbit. It was you know, a few other countries were up there, but we, we had it all to ourselves. And that is not space today. It is a real time dynamic environment with in intense geopolitical competition going on, uh, commercial activity going on. We rely on it for GPS and so many other, and communications. It's really uh, a very different environment and that trend is only going to continue. And so I think the issues that you're highlighting are critical. It, it is more and more valuable and more and more complex all the time and that's why it's an important area of focus. I just want to use this occasion to tell you all about the coolest memo I think I have ever gotten in my life, which was, it's actually a memo I got to sign, and that was a memo that uh, directed the uh, NASA 
to establish timekeeping around celestial bodies other than planet Earth. And as the memo explains, the reason that, that this is necessary is that both special and general relativity will be required to make sure that we keep time accurately in, on, uh, around other celestial bodies. So in addition to everything else, space is just darn cool. Oh my goodness. This is such a fantastic question, and I, I know what my team is thinking. I've got members of my staff over there. They're thinking, what is the senator going to do with this smart question, right? <laughs> and I'll have you know that I read half of a book on space policy, blessedly, on the way back from Vietnam the other day. So I can answer this. The book is something like, it's like the new geography. You know, look it up. Um, and, and the whole premise of the book is, is that space is kind of like Antarctica in the sense that, you know, it's, it's a shared domain right now. And it may, it may conceivably be up for grabs in the future for economic reasons and geopolitical reasons. And so the challenge is do we continue as, as things are and have been in which uh, we, we allow it to be a shared domain under past rules, or do we sort of stare in the face the, the reality that there's going to be a scramble? There's going to be a scramble for positioning on the moon to scoop up rocks, rare earth minerals. There's even a new mineral they found on the moon not too long ago. You probably all know that. Um, do we position ourselves with an increasingly cluttered uh, atmosphere to ensure that we have various spaces of the sky uh, for our satellites. I think in reality there is going to be a bit, you know, there will be uh, an, an effort to stake some claims in the sky and on the moon and beyond, but wherever possible, and this is an area for cooperation with every country on the earth, I hope. Wherever possible, we need to find agreements, rules of the road if we can, to share the domain of space so that we can all benefit from, from the many you know, uh, uh, blessings associated with its occupation. You know, worst case scenario, it can become a place where humanity could, could locate itself. Uh, at some point in the distant future. I don't want to alarm everyone. Uh, in the near term, it can be a source for critical minerals and, and uh, metals and other materials. Uh, and it all, uh, it of course, is, is going to be, uh, continue to be a, a domain in which we can communicate with one another through satellites and, and uh, enjoy the benefits of, of modern technology. We don't, there's an outer space treaty. The United States is not signatory to that. We have the Artemis uh, Accord. So this, you're going to, uh, some of you who are captivated by space and think uh, that you might see a diplomat in the mirror, uh, there will be a role for space diplomats, I think, in the future. And there are already ongoing conversations between uh, many countries. And I, I know Director Pravakar, her office and, and uh, is, is involved in, in some of these conversations with our State Department. So, um, we need people thinking about these critical issues. Thanks for the question. Well, that's great. Uh, let me call uh, Shauna and Annika. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Anika, and I'm a fourth year chemical engineering student here, and I want to work in semiconductors and chip manufacturing in the future. And I spoke with Shauna before about asking this question. Um, so I was wondering, how do you currently see the aspect of sustainability in the semiconductor industry? And how do you see this aspect as well as governmental support for this aspect developing in the next five to 10 years or even way further in the future, if you have thoughts on that, um, in terms of the whole life cycle of semiconductors, including more sustainable sourcing of materials, um, using less energy to process the semiconductors, as well as recycling? These answers come with, these questions come with their answers baked right in. It's, these are a package deal. 
I'm going to jump in because this is something we've been thinking in, in, a lot about and working on. You know, my home's Palo Alto um, when I'm not doing my job in Washington. And when, I, when I'm driving down the main drag, I drive by Superfund sites that used to be where semiconductor manufacturing happened. That doesn't happen anymore because the industry has made an enormous amount of progress. And yet we know we're not done because the materials that go into building these semiconductors and then these complex package systems afterwards and the processing to build them both involve materials that, that we know have environmental and safety and health issues. And so that's a continuing uh, challenge for the industry. And this is an industry that, that what they're doing is so incredibly complex already. If you think about the, the mechanical, the thermal, the electrical properties of the materials and the fact that they have to be patterned to these extraordinary dimensions, all of that is super hard, and then there are all of these issues about sustainability on top of that. So what you're outlining is a, is a key challenge. It's going to take material scientists and chemical engineers, um, and, and I think that there will be ways forward. One of the, we've talked a lot about AI in the course of the conversations today. One of the areas where AI ha offers tremendous potential is to, is to vastly expand the, the, the space in which we can explore for new materials and new, and, and new chemicals and new chemistries. And, and if we can couple that with much more rapid experimentation so that we can go from opening the universe of possibilities to getting to real answers that really work in practical situations. Um, that, that's, where I think, uh, that, that's where I think technology offers tremendous potential for what is a scary hard problem today. Part of the CHIPS Act, uh, when, when, when Congress defined it, they, they defined manufacturing incentives and tax credits for now, but they also put a significant investment in CHIPS R&D because we knew we had a lot more inventing that had to happen for the future. And um, this is an example of one of the areas that I know the Commerce Department and um, the nonprofit that's working with it on CHIPS R&D is focused on. I don't know that I can significantly improve on that uh, answer. So um, I, I would just highlight uh, a narrow area, but a very important area of sustainability, which is the energy that will increasingly be required, electricity in particular, uh, to run the various chips, including those that will be packaged uh, here in, in the West Lafayette area. Um, this is an engineering challenge. It's an engineering challenge in the sense that uh, there are folks at Purdue and, and other places around the world who are trying to seek innovations. Um, software innovations as well as hardware innovations to ensure that less energy is used. Uh, but there's a certain reality that we're likely to encounter, which is we're going to need more electric power and we need to come up with efficiencies uh, to generate it. Uh, there's uh, iterative innovation, occasionally a breakthrough innovation occurring on the electric power ge generation front. Modular nuclear uh, isn't ready for immediate adoption, but I, I hope that earns a significant consideration by policymakers in coming years. Well, that's great. Um, Aaron, Tyler, and Catherine, you guys had a question too? Thank you. So my name's Aaron, um, and this is Tyler. We're both undergraduates in aerospace engineering, and our question to the both of you was relating specifically to AI. Uh, with the use of AI becoming more prevalent, how can we both protect our information from cybersecurity threats and verify the validity of AI-generated information for solving complex questions in both research and industry? And I'm uh, interested in understanding uh, what policies and measures uh, you're planning on putting in place um, to support these research institutions in the ethical uh, use of AI and uh, effective use as well. I'll start. She'll correct me uh, or, or, or <laughs> certainly make additions. Uh, well, for starters, uh, Congress needs to uh, provide clarity to our, our policy atmosphere as it relates to data security. Um, who owns your data? And, and every geography in the country. So we need a national data standard. To the extent we can clarify that, uh, that makes it easier for developers and users alike to accommodate whatever the law is, and then we have a sense of, of uh, what is there for the taking, what isn't there for the taking, and, and um, that's, on Congress and hopefully in coming months or years we'll finally get that done. Um, 
the other question you had, uh, I think related to, I'll give you. What was it? Ethical use. Uh, uh, ethical use. Oh, that was AI. the hard ethical part that I wasn't going use. to answer. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll just turn it. It's, it's already gotten hard for me. So we'll turn it to <laughs> Director Crapper. Kropik- but I will say, um, in, in uh, the next couple of weeks, and probably no more than that, you'll see a white paper document uh, being produced by myself, Senator Schumer, Senator Heinrich, Senator Round. So the four of us, in a bipartisan way, have convened a number of what we're calling uh, AI insight forums so that members of the United States Senate uh, have a better sense of, of some of the challenges and opportunities of AI. But that can only, uh, and, 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 and we want to make sure the United States leads the way by my reckoning right now in the development of AI technologies. We want to make sure that we stay in the lead. But perhaps the thing that would most undermine that is failure to act legislatively on the policy front, because then if risks occur associated with u- using AI technologies, policymakers have a habit of uh, doing intemperate things that constrain innovation. So we're trying to come up with what you might call a regulatory sandbox. Um, <clears throat> we've collected all kinds of information through these insight forums. Our lessons learned will be published uh, in the next couple of week, weeks in this roadmap. And in that roadmap, we will identify uh, what our future policy outlook looks like, and then we ask our members of, of, of the Senate to act. We'll address things like explainability, uh, uh, transparency, uh, safe use, ethical use of, of uh, AI, workforce challenges and opportunities. Um, and, and so your question is both timely and really important and obviously linked to the semiconductor announcement today. Uh, I got to participate in one of those AI Insight forums um, that uh, the senators put together. And I, I, I just want to say how great that conversation was. And it was amazing to have, I think you had more than half the senators in the room. Um, and people were listening, engaged, asking great questions. I think it's a great sign because we absolutely need legislative action. Um, my personal story is that I came into my job in October of 2022. Anyone who was paying attention would, would know that ChatGPT came out into the world in November of 2022. So guess what I spent 2023 doing? <laughs> Um, I felt like my schedule got hijacked by AI, but in the most constructive possible way. Uh, Look, AI, I think this crowd really knows that AI was already in our lives in so many different ways, but it had seeped in. And then all of a sudden when it became chatbots and image generators, everyone understood that there was a big deal happening with AI. And when that really seized the public imagination, President Biden and Vice President Harris were very clear that that this was a priority, it was an urgent priority. And they said, look, this is the most consequential technology of our times because of its enormous breadth. And we know what happens with consequential technologies, good things happen and evil things happen. And so our job is to make sure we manage the risks so that we can use it for all of the things that we know it's gonna be powerful for and necessary for. And that, that's, that's what set us off on our journey last year. Uh, the work that we were able to get done from, from the executive branch, um, just to be, because we can move out, First, we got voluntary commitments from AI companies that's, to try to help point to the right direction for AI. Um, and then very significantly, the president signed a broad, comprehensive executive order on AI in October. And of course, an executive order says, we get it, Congress, you have to make the new laws. But under existing law, the president had tasked us to go find everything that we could be doing under existing law that he could, he could direct through an executive order. And that's what that... It's about a 100-page executive order. So why is it so broad and why is this so hard? Well, you all know better than anyone that AI is simply computing systems that are trained on data of all different sorts and then used to make statistical predictions about things. And here we are in the information age, and that means there are an infinite variety of data sources. Back to your data question. And that really is why AI is so broadly powerful and why its implications are so immense. And so when people talk about the ethical issues of AI, it can be about how do you make sure it's safe? 
It can be, is it embedding and exacerbating bias and discrimination? Is it revealing private information? Is it going to hollow out jobs? Uh, or can we put it on a path so that it allows people to do more and earn more, which is really where we want to go? So the, the, there are a whole host of issues. The work we've done in the administration has got, got us on the right path and I think has been important for global leadership. Uh, the United Nations just passed a resolution that we sponsored with, I think we got 122 co-sponsors, which is remarkable, that just says we've got to get AI right. It just gets the basic principles in place. But that's, you know, that's part of what American leadership looks like, right? It's having great AI companies and, and helping the world get on the right path. So I think a lot's been done. We need, we need more, and I'm really glad to see Congress on it. Um, I just want to finish by saying, I think something that's really important for all of us is, as people in engineering and sciences, your question about ethics is key because that is how we're going to make sure we get the benefits and tamp down the risks. We have to be deliberate about that. And the, the choices that society makes about how to use a powerful technology like this, we're not going to just make it up in engineering, right? Like it's going to take all of society doing that. But we actually have a special responsibility because we see what this technology does. We're the ones that are, we have our hands on it and we see what it's gonna be good for and how it could be used or misused. And so I think it's, I'm so glad to hear your focus on that. Uh, and I would encourage people to just you know, keep that as an integral part of what you think about, whether it's AI or any other important technology you're working on. I just to underscore how important it was uh, that uh, Arati and her team put, put out those executive orders. It provided some measure of, of guidance for the development community, for users, for businesses, and really to the rest of the world about what we're going to prioritize. Uh, we want to make sure that is, as these developers uh, continue to develop technologies, that those AI technologies satisfy our values. They're consistent with our values around things like privacy and consumer protection and civil rights. Not, and I'll be undiplomatic here, not the values of the Chinese Communist Party. We want enlightenment values, uh, the values on which the Declaration of Independence were established to inform development of these technologies. And how do you do that? We make sure that the United States of America stays a step ahead of those who don't share our values and develop in the technologies, and then we harmonize across geographies our laws and regulations with those of our friends. And then if someone who doesn't share our values wants to sell into the largest market in the world, well, they, they better develop those AI technologies consistent with the standards that we have already established. That's really what's at stake here. It's not just you know, tech, technical jargon that's a, it's a, it's, it's our very way of life. And so all of you that enter this field or related fields will be part of that larger mission to make sure that the United States leads the way. This is our space race. We're in the middle of another space race, maybe literally in space fueled by AI technologies, but also figuratively, um, it's, it's a, a competition between systems and we have to win. Here, here. Indeed, indeed. Um, uh, Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm an undergrad in aerospace engineering. And my question was, um, given the time and money that research and development takes, do you see uh, Congress and or the Biden administration um, increasing the budget of scientific programs like NASA, DARPA, and the National Science Foundation in the future to uh, increase research and development pace in America? Well, we authorized a significant increase, uh, the most significant increase in generations through the uh, Chips and Science Act. It would be an increase in funding for DARPA, which has received additional appropriations. So it's actual money, not just authorized under the law. Uh, the National Science Foundation, which has not received uh, the actual money that we need to appropriate, and uh, I'm advocating for more, again, based on the value proposition we've seen over the years. Uh, there's a lot of bang for the buck. Department of Energy Labs, uh, very important research occurs through those as, as well. So uh, if I had my druthers, even amidst this time of sort of fiscal scarcity, when there's great scrutiny appropriately, 
on the federal budget, there are still certain investments that lead to a larger pie, a larger economy. And that helps uh, drive our, our prosperity, our way of life, our national defense. It also brings in more revenue for the federal government. So we've got to be very careful not to starve ourselves of the seed corn that will pay dividends later. And President Biden has just been clear from day one that R&D and, and the federal role in R&D is vitally important. That it's, you know, the president loves to talk about America being defined in a single word, and that word is possibilities. And when he looks at me as his science and tech advisor, he what I see him saying to me is, you guys have to deliver on possibilities. So he understands that this is what this community does. And that's why it's been a high priority. It's why he was one of such such an enthusiastic backer and did a lot of work with Congress on chips and science. Um, and that, so I think some, there's some very important stakes on the ground and we have a lot of work to do to convert that into actual funding uh, because we have not hit the benchmarks because of the budget pressures. And I think that's, I think we were all very disappointed in what's just happened recently. And I know we've got a lot more work uh, to do there to meet this commitment that, that we're all clear about. So much of the research and development in this country occurs through private companies. So I'd be remiss if I didn't emphasize as, as someone who's carried uh, a tax bill through Congress advocating for extension of our R&D incentives. We need to keep incentivizing the Eli Lillys uh, of, of the world, the Cummins of the world, to and, and unknown startups uh, 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 around the United States to invest in R&D, to invest in R&D intensive business models, because every other country is, is doing so. If, if one invests $100 in China and, and R&D, you get $200, $200 worth of credit on your taxes in China. In the United States, you invest $100, and it's not quite zero, it's, it's now $10 because our, our uh, previous R&D provisions uh, have expired. So that's just, that's no way to incentivize uh, the gazelles of, of the future to start up and to be sustainable over the proverbial valley of death. So that's another policy instrument we need to bring to bear. Can I, I want to say something really exciting that I just that just came out. Please. The statistics just came out. The latest statistics on where countries are on spending on R and D, and there's actually really good news. A few years ago, everyone was prepared for China to to, to run past the U S. because they had been growing their R and D spending so aggressively. The most recent numbers actually show that we are still in the lead. Uh, the United States, this is public and private, spent eight hundred billion dollars in the most recent. Um, uh, accounting and China is PRC's total is like 670 billion or something like that. So that's remarkable. But very much to your point, that huge surge in American R and D, that big growth has been driven by private industry. We absolutely want that. When we talk about these huge advances in AI, that's an example of why that is possible. And we have to understand that the seed corn and the foundation for all of that is the closer to the 200 billion that the federal government puts in. It's not the most massive part, but if you don't have that, eventually you don't have the rest. And so it's, it, we, we have to keep our eye on all parts of that. Great. Uh, we're nearing time, but I know Mariana has a question for you, uh, Director Prabhakar. So maybe if we can roll that up into concluding remarks uh, also from your side and then uh, over to you, Senator. Hi, yes. My name is Mariana Artang. I'm an undergrad for aerospace engineering with a minor in nuclear engineering. You occupy a very prominent role of leadership um, for the scientific community as specifically a woman in science, and I was wondering how your role as a woman in the scientific community has affected both your career and your repeated achievements as a leader both in DARPA and NIST, and if you have any um, advice for future women in STEM um, as they navigate their career? Well, I see a lot of amazing women in STEM right here in this room. And I have to say, it's so exciting to come into a room like this and see all the different faces and all the different backgrounds. And I think it represents enormous progress. When, when I was an undergraduate at Texas Tech, 
this is ancient history, I know, but when I was an undergraduate, we, I was in the first class that had two women in it, and everyone was like, wow, there are two women, right? So we've made a lot of progress. There's still more room to go. And, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, here's what matters for women in STEM, but here's what matters for anyone and what, what it is you're trying to do. The way you're going to make a contribution in the world is the same for everybody, right? It's like in the work that you're doing now or the first jobs that you have as you all go out into the world, go find something and go do something useful. Make something good happen and be a good colleague while you're doing that. Be constructive and be good to people and amazing things happen if you just do those two things. Do something useful and be good to people. That's all it's all about. But I, you know, I think um, this country represents the idea that every person gets a shot. And we've, the president loves to say that we've never fully achieved that. We've never lived up to it fully, but we've never walked away for, from it. And that's, that's the uncompleted American journey. And let's just keep at it because it's um, wholly worthwhile. Thanks for having me. And, and, and thank you so much for having me. I guess, you know, the only thing I would add uh, as a parting comment here is, listen, all of you, by definition, uh, because you attend Purdue University, because you are affiliated with this amazing world-class institution, which uh, day by day seemingly uh, improves its profile, uh, you, you will be regarded as leaders, leaders at work, leaders in your community, and um, leverage that, not just to the benefit of consumers, which is very important, uh, but also uh, to the betterment of, of uh, your community, your state, your nation, and beyond. Um, find ways in which you can apply your unique skills uh, given to you by God, cultivated and improved here at Purdue, and, uh, and solve some problems out there, because that's what that's what engineers do. That's what STEM folks do, uh, is, is you know how to solve problems. Bring to bear your unique talents on, on problems in the world. It will enrich your own lives while enriching others. Uh, thank you. Good luck. Please have me back. God bless. <laughs> well, um, so we're going to take a photo shoot of Director Provocker and Senator Young with all of you. Uh, we're going to try to position uh, them here and maybe take the photo uh, from here. But while we do that, please join me in a big round of applause for the director and the senator. Thank you.